Hi. How was the lunch? Good. How is it as it continues? Thank you for joining us. Thank you for getting up early, braving the rain, continuing to be in conversation and community with us. Um, I am Tammy Navarro. I am I'm very excited to be the moderator of this panel. Um, being part of this conference is so meaningful to me. I am uh, many things, uh, one of which uh, is the former associate director of BCRW, so it's always good to be back. <laughs> Um, and right now I have the, the honor and the privilege, as was mentioned um, several times this morning, to be the co-director with Pramila Nadison of the CSSD working group um, that informs this conference that brings us all together. Um, so in many ways, we're continuing the conversation that we started with the panel this morning, um, thinking through issues of coloniality. Uh, and this panel, to remind us all, is entitled The Colonial Legacy, Gender, and Economic Empowerment. Um, Part of the reason that this session in particular I think is so important and meaningful is that yes, it continues some of the threads that we um, sort of started pulling out both yesterday and this morning, but it really I think gives an opportunity um, to continue that sort of interrogation of how these processes are observable across spaces, um, but maybe more importantly, how they operate particularly in different sites, right? So our panelists um, are gonna share their work with us uh, their bios, their full bios are available in the pamphlet, so I encourage you to read all about them and their wonderful publications um, and, and holdings and positions and prizes. I'm just going to introduce them in a very cursory way um, in the interest of time so that we have more time both for conversation and to hear the presentations that they have put together for us. Um, and so the panelists will be speaking in the order that they appear in the conference program. So Yolan Buka is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Studies at Queen's University. Uh, her research and teaching both focus on gender, violence, decoloniality, race, and international relations, and African affairs. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Jennifer Fish, a sociologist who focuses on women's labor and migration in the informal economy with an emphasis on transnational activism and development. Um, third, we will be hearing from uh, Natasha Lightfoot, who is Associate Professor in the Department of History at Columbia University. Um, her work specializes in slavery and emancipation studies, black identities, politics, and cultures in the fields of Caribbean, Atlantic world, and African diaspora history. Dr. Lightfoot is also faculty fellow in the Department of African American and African Diaspora um, at Columbia University. And our final panelist um, in this session will be Keisha Khan Perry, who is the Presidential Penn Compact Associate Professor of Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research is focused on race, gender, and politics in the Americas, urban geography and questions of citizenship, intellectual history, and disciplinary formation, and the interrelationship between scholarship, pedagogy, and political engagement. So let's welcome our panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, uh, a part of this conversation. And I'd like to thank the organizers for thinking of me and for allowing me to be a part of this space. It's beautiful to be able to put physical faces and bodies to names that you read and that you follow on social media. And I feel absolutely privileged to be here today. Um, I am going to make sure that I keep time because I really hope to be able to be in conversation with my co-panelists today. Uh, the prompt that was given to us today was to think about colonial legacies, gender and economic empowerment. I'm not going to present a uh, part of a specific project. I'm working on multiple projects, mostly focused uh, uh, in Africa, in East, Central, West and Southern Africa. Uh, in conversation with black feminists in the diaspora. Some of my work looks at women's participation in politics, women in non-state armed groups, women in militaries, and the relationship between African women and the post-colonial state. Uh, 
So I read this question at the intersection of debates about coloniality of gender and being, and those about uplift neoliberalism and discourses about economic empowerment of black and African women in the post-colony. While women economic, women's economic empowerment is not a central question of my work, its relevance seeps through the conversation that I've had and continue to have had and continue to have with activists, women in government, uh, women in government and in state and non-state armed institutions in Africa, but also in Canada, which is where I live and where I work. To make sense of the proposed question, and because I'm a political scientist and not a historian, I feel a little bit like an imposter uh, because I rely so much on historians' work. Um, you know, I am kind of in, have to interrogate the making of the modern manly state, so the state that is masculine, and how colonies that became states into uh, the international system became part of a heteropatriarchal white supremacist international relations system. So what I'll do is speak briefly about how I articulate the state, and I'm not talking about the nation state, and my students know that I don't, because the nation state is an ideal construct that is really only relevant in my reading of its making in a particular part of Europe. Um, and it's not a naturally occurring phenomenon, but one that required a tremendous amount of violence in order to eliminate difference, even within the territory of France, that required the violence of the state to crush dissent, to crush different languages, to crush different religions, to make what the French identity was when it started to export its empire. So I really focus on the modern state and not so much about the making of the nation in, real, in relationship with the state. So the sta state masculinism and its ensuing international system is quite European at its very foundation. Modern European states emerged from a social organization that upheld the rights of male individuals in the public sphere while relegating wives and daughters as property in the private family household sphere. The patriarchal structure that shaped the state and the state system come with not only the masculine privilege of gendered power, but also male dominate, dominance in male institutions. While male domination is not absolute, many societies relied on the subordination of women, the regularization, the regularization of women's access to men's access to women's labor and bodies, as well as the production of men's monopolies of intellectual, political. Um, cultural and economic power. So modern European societies were built on a masculinist perspective of the state and later invested quite heavily in the replication of these frameworks in their colonies as part of their racial and racist imperial projects. Informed by theories of liberalism, law, order, and progress, and here I would encourage you to read progress as racial uplift, um, these kind of theories became guiding principles in the management of the colonies. Liberal advocates for free trade focused on imperial expansion and classification and hierarchies of people that determine the threshold of sovereignty. Right? So there was a threshold where you be could become a sovereign people. So for thinkers, policy officers, and colonial staff personally involved in European colonial companies like John Stuart Mill, which people love to quote in, in politics and international relations, his work with the East India Company um, really thought about Western modernization and liberal government as a normative rubric that managed relationships between Europeans and the rest of the world. Mill defined the best government as one that could discern those who were unfit for liberty or not capable of self-determination. So if you listen to this, it's really reminiscent of how people think about Haiti, Sudan, and other places around the world, right? So this is written, you know, over 100 years ago, and yes, it continues to apply about how we think about the conditionality of black spaces' sovereignty. Um, so it required kind of this discernment between who were fit and unfit for liberty and capable for self-government. It required, and this is where it's important with regards to gender, it required a nuclear patriarchal family unit with women and children as subordinate. 
These units could then be connected to a civil society that could engage with the patriarchal state. In this hierarchy of nations or societies, race and cultures, non-Western, primitive, backward societies could only hope to achieve liberty and sovereignty through linear development, uplift, empowerment, uh, towards the Western model of gendered and racialized governance. In this system, European and North American countries could use these hierarchies to benefit the upper class of their countries while exercising control on the colonial world um, and promote their version of rule of law and, and, and law and order progress in keeping their peace. So if you study development today, what I just spoke about really resonate with how, you know, in policy settings, people continue to think about development. So colonization really had impacts um, on gender, and these impacts on gender had economic and material consequences for women. When we think about the ways um, the economy was monetized through cash, crop, and colonial taxation, the consequence was the bracketing of women from the formal economy and relegating them to segregated private spheres. This destruction of safety nets that offered women many ways that they could access land um, made them more vulnerable to men. It limited their economic independence. It removed them from decision-making processes and colonization created legal frameworks that codified their dependence on men and the colonial state, and later on, the, the post-colonial state. Most importantly, and really in terms of the metaphysical space, right, um, and the, even the physical one, it pathologized black women, their agency, their sexualities, their role in cultural and intellectual production. The European social construction of gender imposed during the colonial encounter influenced not only African societies, but even how nationalist movements unfold. European inspired divisions of masculine power and feminine domesticity shaped African politics throughout the 20th century. While nationalist movements emerged from various parts of African societies, representation of anti-colonialism efforts were and remain in direct conversation with the international system which favored the state, the manly state, its phallocentric discourse and patriarchal culture as the most important unit of analysis. As such, while African women from all walks of life actively resisted colonialism, even at times where their private and devalued spheres of influence, national and international discourse of independence infused in masculine privilege rendered their label their labor invisible. And we've talked about this in the previous um, panels today and yesterday. Not only were anti-colonial struggles fought for the right of self-determination, but also implicitly and explicitly for many independence leader, for their countries, it was this kind of idea of having a place as equals in a community of masculine states as shaped by European masculine hege hegemony. So here's not the, article, the argument that, you know, the victimhood of women without, high, you know, without highlighting their uh, agency. That's not what I'm trying to make here as argument. Um, and I think one of the examples is that throughout anti-colonial resistance, market women, for example, were formidable foes to colonial authorities and their cronies. Still today, they challenge the state and they challenge the international system. But it is important to understand how colonial, social, and political ordering um, was also an economic, were also an economic one and with material consequences that would reverberate down for centuries until today. At the intersection of the transatlantic slave trade, the end of said slave trade, the continuation and expansion of plantation economies in Africa and um, in, the, in the New World, indentured servitude that created a buffer, buffer races between blacks and whites, particularly in the Americas and at other parts of Africa, and economic reorganizing of African societies, you can trace the process of the cheapening of black and colonized women's labor throughout. You can also trace their disposability, even given the fact that we rely on their labor for everything else. So the triple oppression that was discussed yesterday, 
transnational black feminism and the sensitivity to and engagement with colonized people and the shared struggle, it's absolutely important. But I think what is also important to consider, and I'll try to do that in three minutes, is, um, is to kind of to add to our foundational analysis the fact that uh, to maintain the global political and economic world order, um, you have to think about how uh, people are able to flow, people are able to move, and what kind of people and who's allowed to move and whose labor is required to move. There are possibilities and imperatives for mobility, so there's feminized labor that must move from what people call the global majority into the global north, and at the same time, there are other women who are, have the impossibility of being able to move when they need to. So this is in link with immigration regime, by visa regime, immigration status, um, citizenship, right? So even in our understanding of global anti-blackness and the connections between different forms of solidarities, there are also hierarchies of citizenship, right? So, um, in the worst case scenario of, of, of creation of labor and migration schemes, um, there's kind of like, there's a system, the caliphate, the caliphate system that renders black women, um, you know, kind of dependent on the goodwill or the ill will of those who own their labor contract in places like Dubai, for example, right? Uh, adding disproportionate vulnerabilities to African women in, that, in those systems. So, African women also have managed to carve their space in informal economies in post-colonial Africa. And this is where most black women, where most black women work. The problem though is neoliberal order and car the carceral organization of urban spaces, increasingly carceral organization of urban spaces, um, kind of creates uh, Sp uh, spaces that make difficult their ability to live in a day-to-day. -day. You started to hear about clean cities operation, so the cleaning informal markets, mm -hmm. right, to render urban spaces palatable, legible to international donors. There's a proliferation of market fires in places that are often identified as prime real estate, right? There are also the vulnerability of price fluctuations with very limited or absent space safety net. At the same time as the economic world order is encouraging women to focus on individualistic entrepreneur narrative of development, right? Microcredits, trainings, as if they need more training or training at all, right? And the call for resilience in the face of the retreat of state provision of services, but increased militarization of their daily lives. So one minute in my view. <laughs> okay. um, even from the perspective of the continental initiatives, you may have heard of the African continental free trade area that is being developed and thought about and implemented. And the idea is to create a continental free trade zone where goods and people are able to move freely. It's this idea of creating an African European Union, but with a Pan-African kind of rationale behind it. But there are a lot of tensions about the implementation of this framework. There are tensions about what is free to move. We know that free trade is really about freedom of money, right? It's not about freedom. So when states in Africa are talking about this free trade zone, are they really talking about the free movement of people? And what would be the implication? How would that be set in place? And while you have some governments who are saying you can now enter our countries without visas, it is not the majority of them. It's actually a handful of them who are starting to implement those measures. You must take in consideration the types of rules that govern movement of people. The fact that in some countries, women need permission from male relatives in order to be able to have identification paperwork. There are laws on citizenship that in some contexts only allow fathers to pass down their citizenship. And in fact, feminist analysis of this particular free trade agreement demonstrate how Pan-African goals at the African Union continue to neglect the particular vulnerabilities of women. So when you think about the colonial legacies and gender relations and the economic empowerment of women in those spaces, it requires a type, uh, we need to take in consideration that it requires a type of organization and world making that is sensitive to the way um, 
struggles are connected, but also the specific uh, context in which different types of women live. We need to move towards um, a different strategy about how to think clearly about emancipatory futures as opposed to thinking about economic empowerment in the neoliberal sense. So the logics seem to be very similar from the moment of the colonial encounter and the transatlantic slave trade, and that's because they are, the, lo the logics remain the same. So when we think about a system for black racialized and colonized women around the world, we have to think about the links between them, but also the specificities in their context. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. It's wonderful to see so many students. I have a sense that I'm in a space of years and years of dialogue and community. And among all of us, I'm also so grateful to be here. Thank you to Pramila, Janet. Thank you, Tammy, for organizing our panel. I'm also here as a bit of an outlier as a sociologist who's heavily dependent on photographs. And I'm going to show you photographs today that I've taken in the transnational and the national domestic workers movement in South Africa. So. To start with the words of Angela Davis in 1981, if we look at paid domestic labor as a site of transnational feminist activism and inquiry, she said, why the shroud of silence surrounding this potential of radically redefining the nature of domestic labor? And she went on to say that it was because the capitalist economy is structurally t hostile to the industrialization of housework. And look at where we are today with the commodification and the private and public sector involvement in paid domestic labor. Of course, Premla's most recent book talks about care as the highest form, the highest stage of capitalism. And we see so much investment in making life easier, daily life easier upon whose labor. So these are questions which have been posed for years and years in the domestic workers movement. I'd like to start with the transnational I went to the United Nations in 2010 with the then International Domestic Workers Network, and about 60 women came to the UN, to the ILO, and demanded rights for the first time. The UN had never considered human rights or labor rights for domestic workers. Only two other moments surfaced any kind of dialogue about servants as the source of rights, and that was in 1948 and 1965. And both times the UN came to agree that domestic labor was not a place for competition and therefore not a site for protection. Fast forward 2011, we see this amazing transnational movement of domestic workers who came together to say, we are the subjects of these policies. And this was quite an amazing process to witness because domestic workers were in the UN as workers and it was the first time so-called actual workers came into the UN to speak on their own behalves. So at this conference, we've been talking about narratives so often in the history of black radical women's narratives, and those narratives became part of the formal UN proceedings that determined the first human rights for domestic workers. So women came together and they said, you are speaking about us. These are our histories. Think of us when you're making policy. This is Juan Samavia, who's from Chile. He was the director general of the UN. Domestic workers came to that organization with the support of Harvard University, the Women's and Informal Employment Globalizing and Organizing Policy Research Network, as well as the International Global Union of Food Workers. And they funded the transnational movement of domestic work. And I write about the complexities of that. There were tensions within that in terms of who's speaking for a radical movement for black women's labor rights. Interestingly, talking about free trade, Juan Samavia said in his last era, his last two years happened to be this moment. He said, I am here to promote fair globalization and decent work. So Convention 189 became decent work for domestic workers. Over the course of a two-year process, women came together and literally spoke for themselves in the policymaking process. I'd like to draw upon a few narratives 
that stand out to me in the course of serving as a documentarian and an ethnographer, both in narrative and visual forms. So Ida Moreno is an activist for over 50 years in Chile, and she developed a center for domestic workers as they're aging. Here she is in the United Nations. She never thought she would be there, and she shared this poem. 30 years of life, small, half unknown, as the wildflowers that grow in this land. We carry with us the history of our people who have been through the oppression of those who drew up the borders and our division. That is translated from her original form in Spanish. It was quite a symbolic to see domestic workers in this highly governed, highly hierarchical center of power as they were organizing. And there were mechanisms that maximized access to spaces for voice. So domestic workers couldn't speak in the formal proceedings, but they spoke in moments when there are opportunities for civil society engagement. And there's a whole power relations analysis there about when voices were sanctioned on behalf of domestic workers. Right now, I thought it would be interesting since we're talking about economic justice and the globalization system to take a look just to hear for a moment what it sounded like when domestic workers spoke in the UN. So this is Fish Ipu who represented the Asian region and she's speaking directly about an economic system. Domestic workers caring for others. Mr. President, I ask whether the world has ever seen anything like it such a deliberate movement of so many women as a strategy for themselves and the families promoted by many governments to help relieve poverty. If they were not poor, surely far fewer numbers would do it. This is why we need a far better economic system for the world. We echo Bishop Yu's statements today across our panels, of course. Many questions about representation. Who speaks with domestic workers? How do domestic workers speak? And how are they represented? And how is their voice appropriated? Domestic worker rights became the platform for many, many non-governmental international organizations on behalf of migrant workers, human rights organizations, anti-slavery organizations, anti-trafficking, child labor rights, women's rights, and even faith-based organizations for social justice came forward to say this transnational movement of domestic workers is our central work. And they disrupted the visual space. And I just share this with you here. This was a quilt with the hands of 5,000 domestic workers in Hong Kong, and they took over the city square in Geneva. So domestic workers couldn't speak formally, and yet they used the tools of activism again and again to align and build solidarity across lines of difference. And their visual scape became a really critical part of that transnational activist movement. And one person carried that entire quilt. Uh, in terms of voice, the media representation of domestic workers was truncated the media outlets, when the press were to receive their briefings of what was happening that day in the ILO, domestic workers could not attend. And so this whole machinery that had a lot of power and influence got domestic workers to the front page of the Swiss national paper to say that we have waited 100 years. Um, now they would say, now we are finally on the map. 100 years of slavery is over because it had been 100 years since domestic work had been considered. I wanted to point out a little bit of the narrative. So there's some powerful mantras that became used again and again among women across different spaces. They would say, we, our domestic workers, were the cogs in the wheel of the global economy. We're the backbone of society, of your societies. And I remember one domestic worker uh, said to the leaders making a decision, you wouldn't be here if someone didn't iron your shirt today. You would not be at this United Nations. So very much um, confrontational, using activist tools in the face of leaders who had power. And when the vote came to be, they said, think of your mothers. Think of your mothers when you're making this vote. And in fact, uh, the leader of the domestic worker movement was herself the daughter of a domestic worker, and she went on to become the first female president of Singapore, Halima Yaqob. And she said, I am here as the daughter of a domestic worker. So this rhetoric drawing upon a historical moment became very powerful. Just to point out to you quickly, in the United Nations in Geneva, women from countries came together in ways that wouldn't have been 
uh, seen because of class divisions in their own country. So this is Sonia Danuar Chadhari, who was a child domestic worker. She went on to be an activist. And at the UN in Geneva, she met Pemba Lama, who was a gender rights commissioner for her country. And so there are many questions about the national and the transnational and what the space actually provided. So June 16th, 2011, the great victory for domestic workers right a near unanimous vote is passed and domestic workers around the world sang the song, Slaves No More, down, up, up with freedom. And here you see this platform of the very formal chamber and they, they released a banner which was completely forbidden in this space. And it said, congratulations, now the domestic workers for governments ratify and implement. So of course we can ask questions, what does a policy mean? How do the voices, the, the progressive and transnational radical voices of women, the majority of whom are women of color around the world, how do they form policy? And then what does that policy mean? Because once the policy passed, of course, people ask, what does that change in everyday life? I've been working in South Africa since 1995 with domestic worker organizations. And I remember so vividly one of my first encounters when a woman said, we have democracy now, but democracy stops at my front door because every day I pass through these barriers, these economic and social political barriers that continue to exist. In 2013, the network of domestic workers became a federation. It's the first global federation to be led by women. And there they are with another male uh, international political figure, Jose Mujia, who said, come to our country. We welcome domestic workers. Come and bring your struggle. We are a country of struggle. And Uruguay was the first country to pass a ratification of this convention. And there are now 36, not the United States. Let me take you to South Africa, the origins of this work for me. And here we see this tension between national movements for rights and justice and this international movement. So these are leaders of the South African Domestic Workers National Union. And this is 2001. South Africa came out with its human rights policy protections in a new democratic state beginning in 1995. And in two of the major policy protections, it said this basic condition of employment applies to all workers except domestic workers and agricultural workers, almost all of whom were black women, so-called colored women under South Africa's term. And so these are domestic workers who chained themselves to the gates of parliament for the night. They ask leaders to consider their own rights as they were crafting this new democratic state, which so readily left out domestic workers who were majority black women and who had been so integrally part of that historical labor system that made apartheid run for so long. And there you see the banner outside parliament, women won't be free until domestic workers are free. Let me introduce you to Myrtle Vitboy and I'll close with a wonderful story of coming to know Myrtle in 2001. Uh, Myrtle's known for many, many slogans, but she would always say nothing for us without us. I was a very eager doctoral student in 2001 and I wanted to interview Myrtle. I was coming from Washington DC and I was so eager to hear the story of domestic workers. And she said, not another researcher. <laughs> I have seen so many of you drawing out my story and of course my own positionality is part of that. And I don't know what's happened to the stories I gave. I know you'd like me to tell you about the rape I endured at the hands of the South African police but if you really wanna know our struggle, come and work with us. So I never interviewed Myrtle for that year. I never went back um, with my camera for about six months. We formed a 24 year friendship and she, she taught me a great deal. She went on to become the president of the International Workers Federation and the movement and that's how I got to the UN. So I think as we're talking about solidarity, we see these critical tensions. One is the relationship between workers and the male structures within unions, within their own governments. The other is the, the tension between national and transnational solidarity movements. And the other I hope we discuss in this, con whatever comes of this conversation is the relationship between researchers and academics and activists and those who document the story of struggle from positions of academic privilege. And Myrtle was very, very uh, insistent that researchers think about how they are documenting and what they're giving back, of course, to the movement. 
and there she is marching in 2001 in South Africa. A couple of familiar faces you might recognize there, I couldn't resist. This is Myrtle with the 2019 National Women's Studies Association. <laughs> Thank you so much, Premla, for organizing that and inviting Myrtle. Uh, I have the great privilege of working with Elizabeth Christ with National Geographic in my photographic life. And she said, she was encouraging me to think about long-term projects. And she said, you need to get to know someone in a way that you would like to carry to the end of your life, basically. And when we think about thought partners and feminist academic communities and what we have formed here, I believe we can carry that because so many of us have worked together over the course of decades and seasons, both the political context we've endured and and served within and also the, the communities that we form among each other. So let me close with beloved Myrtle, who most unfortunately left us last year after a very rare and aggressive form of cancer of the cartilage. She knew that her time was short. She had asked me in 2018 if I would consider writing her story. And I said, Myrtle, why don't you write it? And, you know, we can have people help in review your chapters, you know it best. And she said, no, 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 I don't want to do all that work. You write it. <laughs> and so, so I did, and then COVID came, and I had, uh, since that first time when Myrtle didn't want me to tell her story, I have now many, many chapters of her life. I have to really give thanks to Premla, who's not only read this piece and walked alongside me in creating this, but before we knew of Myrtle's cancer, she said, you know, I think you should really get Myrtle to write about why she wants her biography to be told and why she's asked you to write it. And now we have that as an archive and a legacy for which I'm so very grateful. With the International Domestic Workers Federation, we've just released Myrtle's biography. She got to read the first half of it, which takes us through the apartheid struggle and up until the transnational movement. And I just wanted to read a little excerpt from the introduction that Pramila prompted me to ask Myrtle to create. So she says, uh, for the past 50 years, I never stopped fighting and campaigning for us, the vulnerable sector. Within these 50 years, I got divorced. I raised my three children without the support of a husband. There were times I, fin I spent a few days locked up for my belief in justice and decent rights for us all. Today we have labor laws in our beautiful country, but still so much exploitation. As I led the International Domestic Workers Federation, I realized we are far from complete freedom. We are not in control of our own destiny. Migrant workers leave their families behind for years to look for jobs in other countries and unfortunately are most often exploited and treated as slaves. So I want my story to be told and read. I want workers to know we can free ourselves and one day, even beyond my time, I hope that millions of domestic workers will stand up in all countries and stop working for one full day. The world would just stand still. The economy will fall from the impact of our strike. This book is not about being famous. It's about our struggle for slavery to be put to an end and to free ourselves. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, tough act to follow. I'm going to try. <laughs> um, so my story is a bit more personal. Um, so I will just start. Um, so in October 2014, I traveled to the island of my heritage and my scholarly research focus, which is Antigua, to attend the CARICOM uh, which is short for the Car Caribbean community, um, which is sort of like a loose union similar to the EU or maybe the African free trade zone that Yolande was talking about. Um, and CARICOM was hosting meetings focused on what was then a year old effort led by elected officials in former British territories to advocate for reparations for slavery and colonialism from European governments, most prominently the UK. I was also asked to be a somewhat informal member of the Antigua and Barbuda Reparations Commission because each member state of CARICOM 
at that point had formed its own reparations commission that would report to the wider CARICOM commission. And I was asked to be a member of Antigua's commission by its chair, um, Dorbreen Amard, who was a longtime colleague and whose family and mine hail from the same village. Um, but it was not just because of those personal co connections, but in a small place, as Jamaica Kincaid calls Antigua, everything turns on personal connections. So, <laughs> um, so he knew me, he's known me for a long time, so he asked me. But the request was also the effect of the book that I would publish in the following year on the history of Antigua's emancipation process. And thanks to the people who were selling it outside, check it out. Um, <laughs> and um, understandably, I said yes. Um, so I've intermittently contributed to the commission over the years since, um, because I have some knowledge that a lot of people don't actually um, given colonial education in Antigua on the history of um, emancipation as a very incomplete process. And so as the Reparations Commission has tried to bring the issue to the forefront of the nation's political consciousness, I have done certain kinds of public history work to aid that effort. My formal remarks at the conference focused on the fact that newly freed people in Antigua and throughout the wider Caribbean were the first reparations activists known to the region's history. Um, and that to properly honor their efforts, reparations activists in the present ought to focus on their lived experiences and the demands that they made of planters and colonial administrators um, to properly remunerate them for generational theft, um, just to understand how much was, to, was taken from them economically, spiritually, and socially. So the various panels that CARICOM organized that weekend tackled the reasoning behind and the righteousness of reparations as a political project. And those were points that all the attendees could agree with. But the Q&A conversations following every panel revealed very distinct and often dissenting views of all kinds about how the proper reparations process could unfold. And the range in the audience held a different set of stakes in the, de in the reparations debate. Um, so there were people who were representing the black British community, um, a number of community activists from London had come down who were of West Indian descent um, to you know, express their demands. Rastafari had a different set of demands. They were also present in the room. Um, many of them were uh, just as angry at post-colonial governments as they were with colonial governments, given how criticized their religion had been and how criminalized it had been historically. Um, Caribbean study scholars of all sorts who had you know, certain kinds of research to offer the room um, to sort of bring specificity to the debate. Um, there were also people who were campaigning from reparation, for reparations from places that were still colonized in the Caribbean. So folks from places like Martinique and Guadeloupe, folks from places like the USVI, who were also asking the question about repair um, within a still colonized context. So the, the room um, was very all over the place. And it was an, it was an education for me politically. Um, so just to be clear, CARICOM developed a 10-point plan for reparations in 2013, and it still pretty much stands as is today. The 10 points involved the demand for European governments to offer apology, repatriation to Africa, indigenous development, cultural institutions, support for public health, literacy, African knowledge, technological transfer, and debt cancellation. Every last one of those points were up for debate in the meeting. And after my panel, I reiterated and deepened a point from my paper about the experience of Caribbean enslaved women. Um, in particular, that they would have had certain gendered experiences in terms of their labor roles and the daily violences that they faced, given slavery's expectations from black women for reproduction for non-consensual sexual access by white and black men, and for care work for immediate and extended kin regardless of their labor roles, whether they were employed in fields, in slavers' homes, or somewhere in between. And that slavery's propagation 
as a range of US-based black feminist scholars of slavery have taught me, scholars like Deborah Gray White, Jennifer Morgan, Saidia Hartman, they've all said that, um, and many others, that slavery pivoted economically and socially on the functioning of black women's wombs. So that state-sponsored emancipation, legally either in theory or in letter, had to unchain their wombs in order for freedom to extend to future generations of Afro-Caribbean people. So that a, comp a concept of reparations at the time that we're speaking would be remiss if it were not to account for how slavery and freedom had distinctly gendered effects on men and women by, not calling, for by calling for distinctly gendered forms of repair. I said that this fact merited at least an 11th point in the plan that espoused such a focus, if not gender attention paid to all throughout all of the points. At the time, I was also in the early stages of a very difficult second pregnancy, so conveying these lessons to this audience at that moment felt especially poignant. It turns out that I wasn't the first or the last to observe the obvious intersections of gender and reparation. Um, it was said by Canadian Black feminist scholars of the Anglophone Caribbean whose work inspires my own. Here I want to raise the names of historian Melanie Newton and anthropologist Elisa Trotz, who have been rightfully critical of the statist bent of CARICOM's reparations effort because prime ministers and their entourages have been the people out front. <laughs> um, and they have noted the proven sexism of certain leaders, including Antigua's prime minister and St. Vincent's prime minister, among others. Um, and there are specific incidents that I could go into um, regarding them and others. <laughs> um, even a direct, a, a direct member of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, the Jamaican feminist scholar Vereen Shepherd, who was in attendance at the 2014 meeting, expressed her appreciation for my points on gender during one of my frequent bathroom trips <laughs> during the conference saying that she was tired of being the only one raising similar points um, in CARICOM's orbit up to that moment. So in the decades since, I've reiterated my insistence on the need for gendered attention within reparatory justice. I have directed commission members' attention to the ways that also legislation against queer people's existence in the Caribbean is another key reparatory justice issue as well. I've learned from black feminist legal scholars based in the Caribbean, folks like Tracy Robinson and Janelle Matthews from the University of the West Indies Law School, that anti-queer prohibitions against so-called sodomy and so-called cross-dressing that are still on the books actually in most Anglophone Caribbean territories descend from British colonial vagrancy statutes that were passed immediately after slavery's end. So vagrancy laws, if you're not familiar, criminalized the newly freed if they couldn't prove that they had legitimate reason to occupy public space. Read that as proof of employment by a white person of means. It's something that I write about extensively in my book. Slavery's expectation of permanent black servitude and orderly behavior form the basis for anti-queer legal and social context in the present day Caribbean. These histories of gendered inequality as tied to slavery and an incomplete freedom have had direct economic and social consequences at present that deserve repair in the same way that queer peoples and women's presences deserve inclusion in the vision that CARICOM constructs of the various publics that it purports to speak to and on behalf of. Queer people and women's inability to live freely, safely, and solvently in the Caribbean, and I hate that construction, because obviously there are queer women, right? But it's like trying to make it all make sense in 10 minutes. Um, but to live freely, safely, and solvently in the Caribbean then and now, for them to be able to express political views, to assume leadership positions in society, to be materially secure, to form intimacies without the threat of violence, all of that remain precarious in the region now because, in part, slavery and colonialism ensured that it would always be so. But even long after both systems ostensibly ended, the local leaders of African descent who have taken up the mantle and who have critiqued those systems through the language of reparations still don't see these constituencies as in need of, 
or if I'm being honest, worth full-throated support in any public context, especially, again, not in that theoretical windfall economically that reparations, if it came to pass, would bring to this severely underdeveloped and politically unsettled region. And again, it's theoretical. This is a skewed debate that remains only in the realm of the theoretical because CARICOM has yet to convince any former European power to even consider repaying a dime to its erstwhile colonial possessions, right? <laughs> so on the occasions, over the last decade when I presented to the CARICOM Commission um, on behalf of the Antigua and Barbuda Reparations Commission, my points about gender and sexuality in the 10-point plan have landed with only partial receptiveness and have met some vociferous denials. Academic audiences that I've talked about with this issue, you know, talked with about this issue, unsurprisingly are in no need of such convincing, but most scholars are just not quite in the position to convert the more conservative members of Caribbean civil society um, to be found that in that CARICOM milieu. Those who are, often tellingly espouse the same kinds of conservatism. At a 2021 meeting I spoke at, the heads of certain member states' individual reparations commissions like Dominica's said that the smattering of women elected as MPs in the local parliament proved that women there were doing fine. <laughs> Jamaica and Guyana's heads of their commissions visibly bristled when I talked about queer rights. The Jamaican commissioner said outright that getting all of Jamaica behind reparations as a political program would mean that queerness could not be present in the discourse. In February, I heard from Mr. Omar, the Antigua commissioner, that he hadn't forgotten my interventions about gender and sexuality over the years and intended to raise them at a CARICOM meeting last month aimed at revising the 10-point plan. Following that meeting, he sent me a WhatsApp way Car Caribbean people across the diaspora communicate, right? And he confirmed to me that in his words, quote, there was unanimous agreement for emphasis on gender, either in the introductory philosophy and or within one of the specific points of the plan. A somewhat good sign, sure. But I've also heard from a friend, um, Mary Elena John, who is an Antiguan colleague and a black feminist author and diplomat working at UN Women who is also tracking the reparations conversation in CARICOM. And she recently shared with me that the framing of gendered experiences might likely appear within the plan, within the context of understanding them as a past trauma needing general redress, rather than directly naming the material effects of gender and sexual inequity on access to safety and social advancement, on pay equity as ongoing and how both colonial and post-colonial governments in the Caribbean have had a hand in helping to foster this. Ultimately, transnational black feminisms are what have pushed me and others to think about and press for necessary nuance within the CARICOM reparations debate. Raising awareness about how the issues of gender and sexuality are central facets of reparations is but one step. I'm especially struck by Yolande, your words about emancipatory futures as opposed mm -hmm. to economic empowerment. Um, and I think really a truly emancipatory repar reparatory justice project is a multi-pronged effort that just still continues and is open-ended. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much for listening. I welcome your questions and conversation. <laughs> Buenas tardes, boa tarde. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Tammy Navarro and Primera um, Madsen for organizing such a beautiful conference and for inviting me to participate. And of course, I have to give a special shout out to um, Dr. Kim Hall, who's watching from her office. She's my undergraduate advisor. Um, 
I want to begin as well with showing and giving four minutes of my 15 minutes to um, the activists from Salvador. Bahia. Yeah, please. É um silêncio para mim no mar. Na verdade, eu vim da na família de pescadores, né? Meu pai, meus tios, tem um primo, primas, com mais menina também, né? Que do mergulho, da pesca, né, que é Verônica, Vanessa, Ângela, Nala. Aí a gente vive disso. A minha família que me ensinou. Minha tia, meu tio, todo pescador, que eu ia junto com ele, aí me ensinou a pescar. Eu aprendi a pescar realmente olhando, né? Meu pai pescava, meus irmãos pescam. Então, eu aprendi assim, olhando, vendo. Sempre como curiosa, né? A curiosidade é demais. Aí eu fiz a mesma coisa, eu via jogar, jogar, fazia isca, colocar isca, jogar lá o nalho. E comecei a aprender aí, através de vendo as pessoas mais velhas pescar. Nasci, me criei aqui na Gamboa, e estudei, não terminei meus estudos completos, mas vivo da pesca, tenho outras atividades, mas o foco é a pesca. Eu me aposentei da pesca, tenho 61 anos. Aí tive meus filhos, tudo aqui, meu filho nasceu aqui, foi criado, pescador. Tudo pescador. Uma gamboa que a principal forma de vida é a pesca e que não tem uma criança, e seja da gamboa, que nunca pescou, não tem uma criança de quatro anos que não já saiba nadar, sendo filho da gamboa, né? E assim, que ande livre. A gamboa, acho que a gamboa é liberdade, a gamboa é inspiração. Desde pequenininha que a gente pescava, a gente ia pegar uma varinha, ficar na beira da praia pescando, pegando peixinho de aquário, botando na vadeirinha. A vida da gente foi isso aí mesmo, aqui na Gamboa, sempre. Eu mergulho, pesco, depende do tempo. Se for a maré tá limpa, a gente mergulha. O tempo tá brabo, a gente vai tá rede, tirar o sustento, né? tudo que a gente precisa. O Mar da Gamboa é o nosso único espaço de lazer, é o nosso único espaço de vida e é o nosso único espaço de, de trabalho, de manutenção e de manutenção de história. E em Salvador, Bahia, no centro da cidade, ter uma comunidade pesqueira está sendo muito difícil e nós somos uma das poucas que ainda estamos nos mantendo nessa área e vamos nos manter. Nós estamos hoje em Gamboa, enquanto articulação das comunidades e movimento do centro antigo, todos juntos nessa força em defesa da permanência no centro antigo e em defesa da permanência na Gamboa de Baixo. If you've ever had any uh, fish tank of sorts, you probably have fish that these women have caught. Um, in Angela Gilliam's classic essay, From Roxbury to Rio and Back in a Hurry, 
later expanded as Black and White in Latin America, and republished in David Heldwig's 1992 volume, African American Perspectives on Brazil, Brazil's Racial Paradise. She vehemently rejects the image of Brazil as a racial democracy and challenges the notion that a paradise exists there for black people. In Salvador Bahia, before the 1990s, when government officials started marking their houses for removal in order to make way for development and gentrification, residents of the coastal lands of Gambor de Baixo generally say that they did not know that they were living in any sort of paradise. When children, while children drape seaweeds on their head, seaweed on their heads, and pretended to be mermaids, the neighborhood located on the Bay of All Saints lacked basic infrastructure such as indoor plumbing and sewers. The residents were living in social conditions that were well behind the development of the rest of the city. Gamboa is located next to another seaside community, Solar Dono, built on the lands of a former sugar refinery. Coastal, coastal and beach lands were considered undesirable lands reserved for the black laborers from the plantations and refineries and for those who worked in the mansions in the upper city. A section of the Gamboa de Baixo neighborhood was built inside the ruins of the Sao Paulo da Gamboa Fort, built in 1646. An old cannon remains intact inside, and it was used to salute the arrival of the Portuguese royal family in 1808. For the last three decades, urban planners in the Bahian Department of Tourism have been trying to develop the land for maritime heritage tourism, which would entail removing the families that have been living in the fort for over a century with the permission of the Bahian Navy, um, after they abandoned it for military purposes. For coastal residents, slavery and the colonial past did not seem like distant memories and completely surrounded by yacht clubs and luxury residences and hotels, Gamboa residents have resisted the removal of any families as they fear tourism in the fort will lead to the removal of the coastal neighborhood surrounding the fort. In the 1990s, the seaside community of Preguisa, located on the beach next to Salado Nion, was forcibly uh, moved to the distant periphery of Salvador. The government built a sculpture park, now located next to a modern art museum and a beachfront restaurant serving Bahian cuisine with waves and sunset in the background. Residents witnessed the expansion of the Bahia Marina Yacht Club and the construction of more luxury apartments overlooking the bay. They gained access to urban development plans to organize a maritime tour of the bay that would um, include a stop on Gamboa lands, specifically inside the Sao Paulo da Gamboa fort. The plans include historical restoration for tourism as well as restaurants, just like the art museum that was the former sugar refinery. I keep repeating. The construction of piers that resemble the, um, the nearby yacht clubs and apartment buildings will, would facilitate access to the water. With the circulation of these plans, residents began to take seriously the fact that they were living in what they started to call a paraíso cobiçado, a coveted paradise. The beach they played on after school and work, the waters that provided food for their families and spiritual rejuvenation were destined for tourism and luxury real estate development, not for poor black people to live next to and enjoy. Undesirable coastal lands of colonial Brazil, where poor black people settled, built their homes, and cultivated sustainable relationship with the sea, relationships with the sea, were now coveted lands that um, were now co coveted lands required for desired luxury and leisure tourism around the bay. Like numerous other neighborhoods that have since disappeared um, 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 along the Bay of Our Sa All Saints, Gamboa de Baixo, located on the socio-spatial margins of the city on the coastal lands has now become part of the coveted center for tourism and residential development. I'm particularly interested in how Gamboa activists facing the threat of displacement forge a struggle that constructed an image of living in paradise, an image distinct from the state's portrait that the, um, through the media of rampant drug trafficking, prostitution, and indiscriminate violence. The land was desirable, not, for, not the people, just as urban develop developers oftentimes repeated in meetings without apology, they would state, Gamboa is the face of Bahia, but it's not a place for poor black people to live, unquote. In recent years, I've noted a more significant politicization of a language of paradise, 
turning the state's logic on its head. This could be understood as a necessary response to the reality, to a reality that Kristen Smith describes as, quote, a routine politics of gendered racialized terror toward the majority black working class that manifests in the systemic killing of black people by the police throughout the country, unquote. Local activists have described the militarized police terror as part of the process of displacement as a result of assassinations, forced banishments, forcing, um, um, forcing people to flee the violence, for example, and incarceration. In a city with the largest concentration of African descendants, second only to Lagos, Nigeria, and oftentimes referred to as a black Mecca or black Rome, black people have become unwanted in the coveted paradise and face violent removal. As I, hi I highlighted in the introductory essay of the NACLA Report of the Americas Special Issue on Housing Justice in the Americas, Tuesday, March 1st, 2022, was a brutal reminder of this kind of racialized terror endemic in poor black neighborhoods. During an early morning invasion in Gamboa de Baixo, the Bahian State Military Police executed three young people, 16-year-old Patriki uh, Sapucaya, 20-year-old Alessandri Santos dos Reis, and 22-year-old Cleberson Guimarães. Tuesday afternoons were when I usually met with three uh, Brazilian colleagues, longtime Gamboa de Baixo activist, Ana Caminha, Ana Cristina da Silva Caminha, urbanism graduate student, Mateo Stanajura, and literature professor and writer, Claudia Santos, to discuss our graphic novel project entitled, A Coveted Paradise. The project illustrates the lives, and, um, the lives and political stories of the mostly women activists and collaborative scholars who have dedicated their lives to Gamboa de Baixo's struggle. For three decades, these women have battled developers and the police to resist forced displacement and to claim their rightful place on the coastal land, city's coastal lands. The death, deaths of Patriki, Alexandri, Cleberson, and Cleberson were a heartbreaking reminder for Gamboa de Baixo residents and poor black communities in general, that the violent siege on, the cover, of, on, the cover, on their coveted paradise is ongoing, but so too is their resistance. Resistance and fear exist side by side, and I often wonder how black women find the courage to speak out against the terror of everyday life. Somos gente, they say, we are people. The poor black women who courageously reject the police version of events in neighborhoods like Gamboa de Baixo highlight the political urgency of collectively addressing police violence alongside issues of public health, education, immigration, housing, land, and urban infrastructure. In working with Gamboa de Baixo activists for over two decades, I have learned to take a more nuanced approach to analyze the grassroots development of the discourse of a paraíso cobiçado and the political possibility of the preservation of autonomous spaces and in the process Black lives. Gamboa residents now understand the term paraíso cobiçado as a defining linguistic term in the social movement. In our research for the graphic novel, we have interviewed activists who recount stories of an ideal coastal paradise with long coastlines, thriving seaweed to protect the sea life, predictable tides, and, ab and abundance of fish since deteriorated after the expansion of the Yacht Club. They now want the paradise for themselves, but without the past racial class logics of abandonment, socio-spatial isolation, and the threat of displacement to the distant periphery. The construction of the coveted paradise is the key way that they have made claims to the city and the coast, being critical of development logics of demolition while demanding access to modern infrastructure and re redefining black personhood. In this vein, the idea of the coveted paradise also challenges state violence in the form of militarized policing that seeks to clear both the landscape and the people who have inhabited the lands. In 2021 and in 2022, Bahia, with an almost when an 80% black population, was the Brazilian state where the most black people were killed by the police. The majority of the victims were black and from neighborhoods like Gamboa de Baixo. I continue to write about Gamboa, about the Gamboa de Baixo struggle in solidarity with social movement activists who keep the beach, these beach lands as black spaces where they have forged communities and survived amidst the violence for generations. Pol um, politicizing the coastal lands of um, Salvador as a paradise 
to be coveted as places for poor black people reveals how black people have subverted the devastation of the barracoons, the plantations abound around the Bay and present day genocidal policing. I am interested in advancing the idea of how this claim to paradise can, can demand, can be deemed radical, similar to what Kevin Kwashi calls a move to exhibit claims to aliveness and Katya Costa Santos describes as an urgent demand for territorialized joy. Claiming paradise is, a, is radical in a country where death is, system, is systemic and deemed inevitable and in a city where Gamboa is one of just a few coastal communities that remain after decades of bulldozing removals and violent policing. Paradise, in essence, has become remarkable in the realm of grassroots politics. It is where famous artists now want to film music videos and frustrated city residents could find refuge in a pandemic. Paradise becomes a way of claiming the historical right to the city and building a modern city that includes poor black people rather than eliminating them. Thank you. Hello. Thank you all for sharing your work. That was so wonderful and rich. Um, I promise we are going to have time for questions. So I'm going to try to configure all my many thoughts, um, maybe into a compound question and, and take what parts of it um, feel, feel generative to you. Um, in listening to each of you talk, I was struck by the framing that we asked you to engage with the colonial legacy, gender, and economic empowerment. Maybe that's not right. Maybe it is more like emancipatory futures because what I'm hearing when we think about the framing of economic empowerment is the lessons of failure that we maybe haven't learned. So as somebody working in the Anglophone Caribbean, hearing about the continental, you know, FTZ, we have been here before, right? The lessons of free trade zones in the Caribbean and Latin America and Southeast Asia, we know this story. Um, and yet we're still in this mode of economic empowerment. And so maybe the framing is, and so each of you could maybe, you know, if you want to take up um, that provocation, what an emancipatory future might look like in your particular context. You've each sort of gestured towards it, but maybe you want to say more and, because I won't have time for a second question, um, and or. Um, each of you have also said something interesting and really provocative about the spaces of intervention. So you've talked about the work with activists. Keisha Khan, you gave up a significant portion of your time to share their words and their voices. Um, at the same time, a number of you have spoken about formal structures, the UN, CARICOM, these kinds of formalizing structures, both what they offer and what they inhibit, right? Certain kinds of framing are both necessary and legible in these formal spaces, but you also engage in all kinds of spaces of intervention, a graphic novel, um, a biography, right? At the request of, of your friend, informant initially, friend later. Um, so maybe something about spaces of intervention, both formal, informal activist, um, and what these futures look like in your various work lives. Yeah, I'm just nodding because <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I don't know what emancipatory futures could look like across the continent, which is where I do most of my work. I think it looks different, um, and that's an easy cop out. It's complicated. It just looks different in different spaces. Um, one thing that um, I think is absolutely essential to remember is, and I, I keep saying this, I feel like a broken record, so you've probably heard me say this before in the past 48 hours, so those of you who were with me, is the fact that I strongly believe that um, the intimate relationship between the state and capital is one of the reasons why we can't achieve the levels of freedom we're looking for. And I also know, we all know, that the state as we know it is a relatively modern creation. 
not to say that people did not live in societies or in their own forms of state making, that's not what I'm saying, but the state as we know it seems to be not homogeneous, but it's taken upon a particular pattern that seeks to be replicated in order to be legible to the international system. And so what I try to convince people and particularly my students is that the only thing that is constant is change. You know, if you think about Butler and the fact that there is hope for transformation away from the way the modern state is currently constituted and, and in terms of the relationship we have with this, this, this institution. There are a lot of people for whom their life is not necessarily impacted like by the state the way mine is because they live somewhat in the periphery of the state and find ways to live in spite of the absence of the state. And that's true here in this country and many other places around the world. But we default, and I think this is part of the conversation we've had throughout this conference, we default on the impossibility of imagining life otherwise without this particular mechanism that is not eternal. So what I love to think about is instead of defaulting into the evolution of the state disappearing because of a crisis or a collapse, is to preemptively think about models and intellectualization about what life could be otherwise in absence, generally not of the state in our day-to-day -day lives, but as a governing structure that facilitates the flow of capital and not the exchanges between our communities. I was thinking, are we going down the line? Because I'd like to ponder till the fourth person. <laughs> Those are great questions, Tammy, thank you. I guess, I mean, Premla and I have been in conversation about this, the radical transformative roots of domestic worker organizing are partially contested. There's a system of bartering that happened in the UN. I mean, that was very real. And of course, we're not getting rid of domestic labor or radically changing the racialized gender class-based dimensions we're formalizing it and saying now it needs international rights and kind of packaging it. And of course, many human rights organizations and transnational organizations said now domestic work is our agenda. So there was a kind of a commercialization of a movement and it was a happy ending movement. So I'm always very cautious about how to, to situate that. And I go to the leaders who've been part of my life and they would say, you know, we can imagine a world without paid domestic labor. In this world, we believe unions and rights are the answer. And of course, we look at unionization enrollment in this country at 8% and see where the labor movement is, is so weakened in that sense. Um, but domestic workers did have to, to, to barter. I remember one critical moment in the policymaking procedure where they were debating in-kind payment. And they were literally talking about whether or not sugar and toilet paper could be seen as part of the salary. This is 2010. In the UN, I mean, it's on the written document of the paper tiger of the UN, you can still read that. So they didn't win. In-kind payment is still a possible means of salary. Um, and so, you know, I think in this moment, with so many um, possibilities in the movement, there are also these ways in which the, the capitalist system has normalized care labor, which of course is a source of Premla's very recent and amazing book to say, well, it's normalized. It's the source of Hollywood productions. It's, it's part of our labor. And of course, then we'd say the state is still off the hook and to a large extent men are off the hook, right? I'll be back. I'm still thinking as well about what an emancipatory future looks like um, because in the context of reparations, there is a sort of co-optation of the language of emancipation, right? I mean, I'm actively in it as a historian of emancipation in one way, if you think about it. But in another way, there is a kind of corporatizing of reparations. It's flowing through prime ministers. It's giving papers and sessions and sort of, you know, Hillary Beck was speaking at the House of Lords, but, you know, it's interesting. There's a kind of understanding among the people working in that inner circle in CARICOM that sort of everybody else in civil society needs to kind of come to the reparations discourse as they say. And what I was, I, I, and, and others, it's not just me, like there are other people, there's, you know, 
instead of just said, well, have you come to the people? <laughs> you know, there are people just constantly. So the other thing is, is like when I uh, think about the second question that Tammy raised about sort of, you know, um, the kind of spaces of intervention, I kind of feel like the real, you know, work toward emancipatory futures is being done by community organizations already at work on the ground, sort of, I'm thinking about people, you know, who are at work, like the, the group of, of lawyers um, who were pushing to get test cases done so that, you know, when in 2018 Trinidad took, um, quote unquote, buggery off the books, that wasn't, you know, by accident. It was through, I forget the name, I think it's called something like, um, I forgot what the name of the group is too, but there's like specific sets of organizers already doing this work. There are people who are working toward, um, you know, sort of climate justice and people who are asking questions like, you know, Red Thread in Guyana or Life and Leggings in Barbados or Femininity in Trinidad and Tobago, um, you know, ECAD and that's based in St. Lucia, but talking about queer rights throughout the Eastern Caribbean. There are people doing the work that formal CARICOM reparations discourse doesn't quite do reach, won't reach, okay. really. Um, and I don't even know, again, if if the money comes, <laughs> will that, will that, where will those two sets of, yeah. of, of constituents cross? Will there be intersections between that? I'm, I, I raise it because I'm not sure. And I don't know if they feel like I don't know that their work will ever stop just because something like reparations was given. Because again, we also need to get into the, the thorny question of can you ever quantify how to repay that debt? Because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, so, so that's, um, I, I feel like there's a lot of different to your question, I just raise more questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for those questions, so much to think about. Um, first of all, I always, I, there are times when I always say, um, you know, I, I really want to do more comparative work and I'm trying to do more comparative work, but I end up still kind of focusing on Brazil and Latin America, um, primarily because I always say, like, if, if we really want to think about kind of black liberation more broadly, I mean, we have to look seriously to some of the countries that have a significant black population, right? So I think um, I can teach it, um, but to tell people, look, you know, if 57% today as a result of racial consciousness, um, I self-identify as black in a country with over 200 million people, well, you know, that's a significant black population. Um, so we have to pay more attention. And, and that doesn't account for um, places like Ecuador, Colombia, um, et cetera. So I think um, it's important for us to, you know, to figure out what kind of, um, kind of neo-slavery mechanism still exists in these places. And I think what's particularly scary about the kinds of emancip um, emancipatory present that people are trying to construct for themselves is the kind of autonomy um, that people are trying to, um, or what they call in Brazil as well, ben, ben viver, or good living, um, that people are trying to actually materialize right now. Um, there is a system of dependency that still exists and for a lot of black women, the most important system in Brazil is domestic work, and it is the most direct tie um, to slavery, right? So a lot of people are, are trying to, in essence, cut the ties um, of slavery um, by not engaging domestic work. And that's why you find in these communities more and more young women deciding to, for example, find other mechanisms like fishing. So for example, um, for many years, um, fish tank fishing is the, was one of the main kind of forms of income, but other, um, other kinds of fishing have now um, increase. You see more women wanting to, you know, construct their own boats, a lot of women with their own bars. As a matter of fact, the last visit when I took some students, ran into a friend, um, Hita, who someone came up and bought like Tylenol and then they wanted a condom. And then she's like, we got everything in this shack right here, <laughs> this shop right here. So, but this idea of women's autonomy in a neo-slavery system is extremely, extremely dangerous um, in a system that depends on women's enslavement on a daily basis. Those high rise buildings, on every floor, there's at least, I mean, there's a housekeeper in every apartment doing work, the work in order to maintain white supremacy and um, an economic hierarchy in those societies. And also you have women now that are inverting the logics around, even just to, to say, 
um, why are why are young men going into um, drug trafficking, for example, is because they're cut out of formal markets in terms of labor markets, or even the formal labor markets that, um, does not allow them to make the kinds of access, the kind of resources that they can access as drug traffickers, but also um, that they, it also relies on a certain kind of education um, that they've also been cut out of. Um, as you even hear the examples of Preta, who says, I didn't finish my studies, but there's also a lot of people who finish their studies and then can't get access to the university system, even with affirmative action, right? So I, I think um, there's something for us to, to think about how people imagine paradise for them or, or emancipation um, for themselves, but also um, in a way that they have control over their, their own economics. I think that's particularly scary in a society with a white minority Right, um, and I said 57% are people who self-identify, right? Um, so I think that is particularly scary for people who are trying to build that um, kind of um, make claims to space, make claims to territory, make claims to their own economic future instead of uh, what people with uh, black feminists have called Pajir Smala, which is like they want to continue to, for example, barter labor for goods. They want you to continue to beg um, and get small things, migalia, as they call it, um, and not, in essence, um, create sustainable lives, access in territories that allow you to do that, right? So, um, so so much to think about, but that's one way I would say that I can see black women um, and, and poor people in themselves trying to think about how to make, um, create emancipatory um, presence for themselves. Thank you all for that, yes. Yeah. I'm going to make an executive decision and take a few extra minutes to just open it up. Sorry. <laughs> uh, questions, please, for our panelists. And we have students circulating with the microphone. We have one over here. Hi. Um, I have an observation and then a question, and then everything will probably devolve. <laughs> So I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I am queer, I am non-binary, I am in my late 40s, um, and I used to organize until it became unsafe for me to live in the Caribbean. And now I organize here, and I work with ECAID, Kaiso, all of these people all over the you know, islands, and Colin Robinson was a friend. Like We've done so much work in the Caribbean. And so my question, well, first, the observation would be like when we're talking about reparations, I personally and my friends uh, think about what it would mean to expand reparations to be inclusive of American imperialism in the Caribbean. I've also mentioned that. Yeah. <laughs> because I've watched my mother's generation have powerful black and brown women do so much with very little access to education, work in the government, become something their parents couldn't imagine. And like I, I tell people when I introduce myself that my mother cut sugarcane. She's the eldest of her siblings. She cut sugarcane and her mother sh cut sugarcane, right? And not my generation, but my nieces and nephews are in school and they don't have to cut anything unless they want, they have their own garden at home because they're fancy, right? And so like when I talk about reparations, I'm including American imperialism, but I've also watched how the concept of womanhood in the Caribbean, because everybody was agricultural, working side by side, cutting in the fields, so there was no weaker gender. And, you know, my grandmother lived, outlived her husband. And so she was like raising 10 kids by herself, cutting cane, swimming with alligators. And like, that's not a weak woman, right? And But the concept of American white womanhood is now really prevalent in sexist and misogynistic conversations in the Caribbean. And I'm watching American imperialism continue in the Caribbean through evangelical exports. Yeah. Conversations around gay men, trans women, and, and like that, vitriol wasn't there when it was unsafe for me. And now there's this weird dichotomy of 
visible activists and then rhetoric that is so violent that I only associated with America, like the United States of America. And so like that is an observation. And I would ask like as scholars, what are your working definitions of like womanhood and femininity? Cause you know, it's, it's an attack on anything female that really is, is the conversation I think around feminism. Like, what are your working definitions? Because I struggle with it, and it literally changes in the audience I'm, like, trying to talk to. Because I want them to hear me and not debate talk, you know, language. So, like, I would ask, my question is that, and then my observation is, someone who's lived in so many different spaces, I no longer have a home, but I have, like, all my peoples, right? And so, like, I ask you, because you seem to be doing this traveling and your sense of self changes. So like, what are your working definitions? And, and like, when you talk about reparations, it's not one conversation because the history of Jamaica is not the history of Trinidad, you know, cause we have gas and oil, right? So it's a different conversation. I feel like we could be here all night yeah. with all the things that you said, but here's the interesting thing I want to start with, which is the expansion of reparations to US imperialism is huge because it actually doesn't even just begin with the kind of cultural soft power stuff that you're talking about of like, you know, evangelicalism, um, you know, sort of US like, you know, values sort of seeping in through cable. You know, remember when TV used to go off in the Caribbean, like <laughs> now it's just on all night cause you just have like all the, you know, all the US cable stations, right? But even that sort of change over, that's one thing. But I would even bring up like earlier stuff of say how, um, you know, US imperialism throughout the Caribbean militarily in the middle of the 20th century that was financed by Canadian banks, thanks to like my understanding of pe from people's work like Peter Hudson, right? Like this idea that there's a whole, um, you know, sort of apparatus through which colonialism's mechanisms continued far after the formal rep relationships and name had existed so that there was always multiple hands in the pot for how um, Caribbean exploitation economically um, and politically took shape. Everybody was involved, so everybody should be paid. So that's number one. I agree with you that the US, Canada, everybody owes. Everybody owes everybody. And that's the other thing, it's like, you know, cause I even think about what's happening now online um, in terms of quote unquote diaspora wars and the things that I see with different sets of black people telling other sets of black people that they don't understand. And it's like, ooh, you know, that you're actually losing a bit of the plot, the fact that we're all sort of like transnational, we're, we're sort of all facing, you know, maybe di distinct oppressions, yes, but distinct oppressions coming from transnationally configured networks mm -hmm. of economic and mm -hmm. political power, yeah. right? So I don't know. So that's kind of going big. Going local to like the very sort of like on the ground fine green processes you're talking about of changing definitions about gender identity. Um, I don't, I, I kind of feel like it's, I, I feel like multiple definitions of what is womanhood are now existent side by side. And some of that is because there is that, that older generation, that your grandmother's generation is still sort of in the minds of certain people, but I do feel like increasingly we're paying homage to what's, what's fast becoming ephemeral in that generation. And that something else is happening with the commercialization of carnival, with the commercialization, with, with tourism still being proffered as, as the emancipatory future of the Caribbean, which means a certain kind of domestic servitude, mm -hmm. sexual servitude, mm -hmm. the sort of the, the loss of land, the loss of sea access. I feel like, and all of those processes have very much um, a, a component of women's, mm -hmm. and, and that, their, that their lack of access is at the center, that their labor is what makes every new hotel happen. Mm -hmm. Every single, you know, sort of marketing package happen. Mm -hmm. you know? So I don't, I, I feel like it's like people don't, haven't forgotten the strong grandmothers, the people who are in the bush, that that's not 
gone yet, but somehow something else is crowding the space. And certainly it's, it's, it's important to note that yes, there's US influence, but it was readily received and taken up yeah. quickly and mobilized yeah. something. It spoke to something local that was changing too. And I don't know if it is the transition from an agricultural to a service oriented mm. economy that allowed for that. Um, so I'm, I'm still not, I don't know if any of this is, is answering anything more. I feel like, again, all I do with great questions is just raise more because <laughs> that's the best I've got, but okay, well, I we fully appreciate everything that you said. And I would love to talk more with you because again, this is stuff, uh, you know, you're, you're in it, you, you know, Colin Robinson was your friend. I just read about him and <laughs> admire, you know, peace to his rest, like admire what his legacy is, you know what I mean? But again, I'm an academic, I'm not necessarily an activist in the same way, but yeah. it's those lessons that help me to understand in many ways, like where the real project of emancipation continued from the first generations of people that received freedom that I'm talking about in my book. That's what I think carries that, this work on, not necessarily Caricom, uh, you know? But thank you for that. Thank you. It's I am more. so sorry to end us, but I'm not going to end us. In fact, I'm going to encourage us to segue into more conversation. Um, please feel free to engage our panelists. Let's thank them. Thank you.